أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله أستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من يهده لا فلا مدلة ومن يدلل فلا هادية وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له عز وجل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين جداي الساعة من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يأسه ما فإن لا يدر إلا نفسه ولا يدر الله شيئا أما بعد فقال الله تعالى في القرآن القريب في السورة الروم بسم الله زهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعد الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون وصدق الله العظيم وأيضا عن أبو دار الكفاري رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن ربه قال يا عبادي إني حرمت الظلم على نفسي وجعلتهم بينكم محرما فلا تزالوا وصدق النبي الكريم بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الكريم ونفعني وياكم بالذكر الحكيم إنه هو جواد رؤوف رحيم الآن حي التارج I seek refuge in Allah from Satan, from Shaitan, the accursed devil. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, all praise is due to Allah. I seek his help and beg his forgiveness, and we seek refuge in Allah from the mischief and the evils of our souls. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none who can lead that person astray. And whomsoever Allah finds in error, there is none to guide them. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity worthy of worship, except Almighty Allah, glory be to Him, who is one, alone, and unique without partner or associate. And I bear witness further that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him is Allah's servant, messenger, and apostle. And he, Allah, has sent his messenger in truth and with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and also as a warner in advance of the hour of judgment. Therefore, whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger, surely that person is rightly guided and whomsoever disobeys the two of them Surely that person harms only his or her own soul. They harm not Allah, the slightest little bit, as for it follows. For Allah, glory be to him, has said in the Quran in the 41st ayah, the 41st verse of Surah number 30, known as Surah to Rome, the Roman Empire, Bismillah. Mischief, evil, has appeared on land and sea because of what the hands of men have earned. 
in order that Allah may give them a taste of some of their deeds in order or perhaps that they might turn back from evil and also there is a sacred hadith, the Hadith Qudsi, narrated by Abu Dar al Gifari, may Allah be pleased with him, wherein he said that the Prophet Muhammad sallam, said that his Lord said, O oh my servants, I have forbidden oppression for you. I have forbidden oppression for myself and have made it forbidden for you or amongst you. So do not oppress one another. And surely Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has spoken the truth. O you who worship Allah, we want to focus today for a little while on two mighty sociological forces that we find in the lives of man. One of them is uh, what we call in Arabic, Huriya freedom. The other is zul, oppression. Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala has made one the nature of the human being and has forbidden the other. And when we look about ourselves, in this day, in this time, all this week, and the week before, and the week before that, we see a great battle going on throughout the earth. <clears throat> not just in America, or not just in, where, in the West, or not just in the East, or the North, or the South, but throughout the earth. There is a great battle, a great war that is taking place. And I say to you that this war is a war between the forces of freedom and the forces of oppression. And oppression, Allah says, I forbade oppression for myself and I have forbidden it for you God and us or you human being therefore don't <coughs> oppress one another the word that is used in the hadith that I just quoted is a hadith Qudsi the word translated as oppression is zulm Alternate translation, darkness. Alternate translation, evil. The sense there, in the translation of this hadith, is a darkness of the heart and of the mind and absence of the divine light of guidance that comes from Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala, nur as samawati wa art the light of the heavens and the earth, an absence of that light. And as the result of the absence of the light of the creator of the heavens and the earth, people's minds and hearts and their resulting actions become engulfed in darkness, resulting in oppression. oppression of themselves <clears throat> and oppression of their fellow human beings. 
O you who worship Allah, <coughs> Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, in Surah to you know, the Surah number 30 of the Quran, named after the Roman Empire. When this ayah was revealed, the Roman Empire was still in power. It was what we now call a global power, superpower politically of that time. The Roman Empire was a political empire that encompassed great parts of the Asian continent, or I should say Eurasian continent, Europe, Asia, stretching on into the Holy Land that people like to call in modern political language the middle, so-called Middle East. I don't, know, I don't use that term myself. Anytime you hear me use the word Middle East, you know, I'm putting it in uh, what do you call it? Uh, quotation. I use it parenthetically. It's a European imperialist and colonialist term. And now I hear the people subjugated by Europe referring to their homeland as the quote unquote Middle East instead of referring to it by the name that Allah gave it to it. We're going to get to that later. So the Roman Empire was this vast, encompassing empire of territory and military might characterized by shirk characterized by the worship of gods other than Allah, the worship of gods other than the one true God. And characterized by great arrogance, Iblis type arrogance. The rulers of the Roman Empire, their attitude was Civilization is determined by our borders. And whoever lives and exists within the borders of the Roman Empire is civilized. And whoever accepts the values of the Roman Empire, they are civilized. And whoever lives outside of the borders of the Roman Empire or, or does not live by our values is a barbarian is a savage worthy of conquer. That, that was the read history. That was their operational philosophy as an empire. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during a time of this great uh, existence of empire Allah starts off the ayah referring to his downfall. But Alif Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alif Lam Mim, the Romans have been defeated in a land close by, but they, even after this defeat of theirs, will soon be victorious within a few years. With Allah is the command in the past and in the future. On that day shall the believers rejoice. With the help of Allah, he gives victory to whom he will. And he is exalted in might, most merciful. It is the promise of Allah. Never does Allah <coughs> fail from his promise. But most men know not. That's how the ayah starts off. Starts off talking about the fate of the Roman Empire. The fact that it existed mightily, underwent some uh, declines in power, then rose again, and finally fell again, never to be resurrected again. Allah says, travel through the earth and see what was the fate of those who lived before you. The books of history are replete 
with great empires that existed at one time and no longer exist. Rome, ancient Egypt, uh, Babylon, England. You know, in modern times, of England, the British Empire was everywhere. And everybody up under their uh, political rule and subjugation. Now they're just a little country. Nobody really paying them a whole lot of mind on the world state, on the global state. And I was reading an article the other day said that while it is still considered a powerful empire, the United States of America is not what it used to be. You know, where they snap their fingers and the world dances. Those, those days are over, right? You don't believe it? Keep watching. So in this verse, named after a now extinct global empire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places in his words, his speech, Zahar al-Fasad fil bari wa bahri. That facade, you know, evil, uh, uh, satanic mischief, corruption, Zahar al. I don't like it in translation said, mischief has appeared. No, it, Zahar al means to uh, uh, to uh, become ascendant, you know, like when the sun rises in the morning. That's that's the sense conveyed by the word zahara to become visible and ascendant by degrees. So the image that Allah is conveying through His speech is that of an evil and a corruption rising to a position of eminence and prevalence and power. And it's not because of any magic. Allah has said that this great gradually encompassing evil that it exists or that it is occurring because of what the hands of men have earned, because of what human beings have done. that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala may give them a taste of some of their deeds that perhaps they may turn back from evil. This is a universal principle of human affairs. Applicable to the past and to the present. So, and when we look about ourselves in the present, we see all manner manifestation of uh, 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 facade, wazul, corruption, evil, all around us, resulting in the primary violation, not only of the principle of freedom, but of life itself. And the planet is suffering. It's not even directed. The evil is not, in, not even just directed at people. Plants are suffering. The waters of the ocean are suffering. The air is suffering. And creatures on land and in the sea are suffering because of the same evil. perpetuated by the same people. And when I say the same people, I'm not talking about like a, 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 a ethnic group or a racial group. I mean, people of the same values and evil mindset. And Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala makes it clear that he allows this to take place so that the cycle of history and the arc of justice will kick in. So that the people who are perpetuating evil, sooner or later, their evil starts feeding back on them. 
just like with individual people. If you have a person that goes around constantly perpetuating wrongdoing on other people, they're always lying, always talking about somebody, always beating somebody out of their money, uh, you know, or always engaged in some wrongdoing. Sooner or later, that's going to come back to them. They're not going to get away with that forever. So it is with people as a whole. So when people, no matter how powerful they might be, no matter how many weapons they might have, no matter how much material wealth they might have, if they use their material wealth, their social and political influence, their political power, their military power to perpetuate evil on other human beings, sooner or later the evil that they impose upon others is going to whiplash back at them and, for, and they're going to get little warning signs and then after a while the wrath of Allah will descend upon them and they will be no more. History shows that. Oh, you who worship Allah. <coughs> and when we look around ourselves, we see all kind of evil and corruption manifesting itself, resulting not only in the deprivation of sacred freedom, <coughs> Allah has made freedom the nature of every human being. Nobody likes to be oppressed. No one likes to be captive. In fact, this is not even <coughs> a, a, a principle confined to human beings. Even the, the animals and creatures are like that. You take a bird and lock it up in a cage, first time you leave the door open, the bird is gone because it's not the nature of that bird to be locked up and confined by someone more powerful than them. You take animals, put them in a zoo, train them, feed them, make them dependent on you. First time that door is left open to the cage or somebody's not looking, that those animals in the zoo who might have been born in the zoo and don't even know anything about the world outside of the zoo, they're going to be gone. Why? Because freedom from captivity and oppression is the nature of created things. Oh, you who believe. I point out this <coughs> characteristic of creation. Because all around us we see the struggle going on between freedom and oppression. Recently in Gaza, almost 2,000 people killed on one side and less than 100 on the other. Someone asked me, why do the people in Gaza, the government, Hamas, and whoever else, why are they firing rockets at Israel knowing that they're not going to get through? Somebody asked me that the other day. And Israel has what they call the Iron Dome. They know those rockets are not going to get through. Why are they constantly and relentlessly firing those, those rockets? Someone asked me. I told them it's a manifestation of their will not to be dominated. That's the, when you see that, that's what that is. They're saying, you're not going to dominate us. We're not giving in to you. And regardless of whether these rockets reach you or not, we're going to keep firing them until you come and sit down at the table with us and deal with us like human beings in a spirit of freedom and liber liberty and not in a spirit of subjugation and oppression. And we're not going to compromise on it. That's what that is. They're not crazy. 
and they're really not even hurting anybody. I mean, uh, you, you understand what I mean? In proportion. Yesterday, I was asked to uh, speak at a rally downtown, Times Square, big rally, a couple thousand. Yesterday marked one year anniversary of the massacre in Egypt and what's called uh, uh, Rabia al Adawiya Square. Those of us living in New York here, you remember a couple of years back we had uh, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement and they were down in uh, what you call Zakati Park and they were, you know, they tenting in there and they were protesting injustice, nonviolent. Well, in Egypt a year ago, after the military took over the government and put uh, Mohamed Morsi out after he had won an election, many thousands of people in Egypt, they decided to assert their right to freedom of speech, their right to freedom of assembly, their right to uh, uh, vote for who they wanted to vote for and to back the candidate that they wanted. And they declared a, 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 a non-violent protest. And this non-violent protest was in two wide open spaces in Egypt. One was called uh, uh, Nahda Square, and the even larger one was uh, Rabia al Adawiya Square. And they just camped in. They were uh, protesting nonviolent, which is an American tradition, by the way. Eventually, the government there decided, well, that's enough of that, and sent in the army. And according to media reports, by the time the army went in with tear gas and clubs and rubber bullets and all kinds of armament and weaponry, close to 600 men, women, and children had lost their lives. This, this is not 600 violent revolutionaries, 600 innocent, non-combatant people who decided that they were going to protest nonviolence. And apart from the 600 who were killed, there was another 4,000 who were, who were injured. One of these uh, uh, organizations, uh, what do you call, Human Rights Watch. They called it, quote, the most serious incident of mass unlawful killings in the history of modern Egypt. So yesterday, people, Egyptians who live in the city here, they had a uh, large nonviolent demonstration down in Times Square, you know, protest, remembering, saying, the lives of those people who were killed is valuable to us, and we're not going to let this day go by, you know, without remembering it, remembering it publicly and standing up and raising up our, our voices and beating the drums to honor those innocent people who didn't want anything except the freedom that Allah has given the rest of his creation. So they asked me to come down and speak, which I did. But in my speaking, I had to say to them, this is not an Egyptian problem. This is not just a problem of, you know, Egypt and the 
military in Egypt. I asked them, did you watch the news last night? That's what I'm saying to them yesterday. You watch the news of what's going on in uh, Missouri, I said to them, where people, innocent, nonviolent, men, women, and children, gather in the street for nonviolent protests in order to say that the life of the young man who was killed there, Michael Brown, his life is precious to us, and we're not going to let you just keep killing innocent people. We're going to raise our voices up in an act of non-violent jihad. Sometimes people hear me use that phrase, non-violent jihad, and they get confused. I, how could that be? I thought jihad means violence. No, it doesn't. Jihad means struggle. It's all manifestations of jihad. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, great jihad is speaking truth in the face of a tyrant. It's called verbal jihad. Waging jihad against the evil desires of oneself, spiritual jihad. Jihad of the pen, jihad of the tongue. And as a last resort, jihad of the hand, or jihad of the hand and weapon. That's, that's really how that goes. Prophet of they said, I said, when you see an evil, <coughs> he said, change it. There's nothing in the religion of Islam that tells people that you have to sit still and be oppressed. Nothing in our religion says that. That you have to sit still and let people abuse you. On the contrary, the Prophet said, if you see an evil, change it. Do something about it. Meaning he said, change it with your hand. Meaning do something about it. Organize, mobilize, resist, whatever you can do. He said, if you can't do that, speak out against it. Use your tongue and struggle against the evil. He said, if you can't do that, and verily, there are people who can't even do that. There are people who, no matter how great the evil or the gravity of it, as soon as they open their mouth to just speak against the evil, they're in jail, or they get killed, or their family gets killed, or the FBI kicks in their door, or, or, or the, the, the secret police in Africa, in Asia, in the so-called Middle East, kicks in their door and drags them out just for talking. That's part of the reality of the people versus empire as they seek freedom. The Prophet of Islam said, if you can't speak out, the first thing he said, you need to do something about what's being done to you. And if you can't do anything, then at least speak out about it. If you can't speak out, he said, then hate it in your heart. Man. Resist it in your heart. He didn't say, well, you say, well, nothing I can do, man. Let me just go along with the program. He said, no, resist it in your heart. But he made it clear. He said, but that's the weakest of faith. That's what weak believers do. Well, I can do it. Let me just, no. Until I can get to a more powerful position. <clears throat> and there are many examples of that. So as I'm talking to these Egyptian brothers and sisters, I said to them, you need to look at what's going on in Missouri, where people are doing the same thing that you all were doing in Egypt last year at this time, with the same response <laughs> from Empire. I know you saw that footage. Here's people doing what uh, we've been told, particularly African Americans, we've been told that the superior resistance to injustice in America is nonviolent protest. Isn't that what we're told? They hold Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. up, even though in response to his nonviolent leadership, they murdered him. 
but they still, they, you know, they hold him up and say, well, this is how you do it. So the people said, okay. Even though we have this ongoing problem here in our town, and the police function like an occupying army, keeping injustice, we, we're going to keep it nonviolent. Especially after some undisciplined people went looting and stuff the other night. We're not with this. We're going to do it like this here. So they line up and they, you know what I mean? They just chanting and then eventually they sit down with their hands up in the air. The response, <coughs> the army comes out. The show enough occupying army. <coughs> the police force. I don't know if you all follow this stuff, that over the past couple of decades in the United States of America has become increasingly militarized. That's where we live. I mean, so they came out with all this stuff. Nobody got a gun but them. Nobody got cl clubs but them. Nobody got tear gas but them. <clears throat> and so what did they do? Then they attacked the people who were sitting in the middle of the road, nonviolently, with their hands up in the air. <clears throat> and, it, you know, if, and you can look around the world and see all kind of examples of that same kind of thing. All over Africa. All over Asia. All over Europe. Same thing. They're no different. In the global struggle for Huria and against Zul. So I mentioned this, uh, dear brothers and sisters, so that we might have an informed attitude about what we're supposed to be doing as Muslims. I'm sure I don't have to remind you that most of the global oppression of Muslims that's taking place right now is being done by other Muslims. I mean, I'm just going to tell it like it ugly is. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't care how ugly the tyrant or whatever, Muslims killing other Muslims. Muslims blowing up mosques to which other Muslims go to pray. Muslims attacking other Muslims, dragging them off into slavery and all of that kind of stuff. This is part of the ugly reality of what the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come to as we point the finger at the Kufar and point the finger at Christians and Jews and Mushrikeen and other people and say, no, they're the problem. No, they're not the problem. We're the problem. Engaging in that which Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala has made haram. I read the hadith before. Allah said, I don't oppress anybody. And I'm the one of supreme power. My armies are angelic armies and the armies of, of, that encompass the heavens and the earth. I have the power to destroy entire civilization and I don't oppress anybody, Allah says. And I forbid oppression for you, human being, let's use the word nas, mankind. I forbid oppression for you, so don't oppress one another. So this evil that's all around us, and I always tell, I tell brothers and sisters in America, don't just be looking at and pointing your finger at the, the injustice and the facade, the zul in America, and ignore what's going on all over the world. And I also tell brothers and sisters who are from other parts of the world, don't just be looking overseas and talking about what's happening here, what's happening there, what's happening in the other, then ignore what's going on down the block. No, we are Muslims. And Allah has made all zoom forbidden, haram. Not some of it, all of it. 
So we ask Allah to barakah with the honor to fill our hearts with the type of human empathy that the message of Allah salat, said characterizes his ummah. The Prophet salam, said, my ummah is characterized by compassion and love for one another and empathy for one another like the parts of the human body. That's what he said. I didn't say it. And he pointed out, you hurt one part of your body, the, uh, over here, the other parts of your body feel the pain. Respond with fever. Something drop on your toe, not your foot, your toe. You feel, man, you feel that throughout every cell of your body. You get a toothache, not a mouthful of teeth, one tooth with a cavity or whatever, you're, you're, you're in such pain, man, your whole body is saying, man, go take an aspirin, go to dinner, do something. Because we are suffering. That's the, the, the uh, example that Allah's messenger used of how we supposed to feel about one another. You see somebody suffering over there, a human being, like I said last week, don't even have to be human. Right? Not in this religion. This religion, you know, a woman saw a dog dying of thirst and, and she was morally compromised. Now she's a prostitute. She's like them young girls up in the Bronx. I'll talk about that some other time. Okay? Prostitute. Sees a dog dying of thirst. Thirst, pull a shoe off, climb down in the well, get a, a shoe full of water and bring it up to give the dog something to drink. The Prophet of Islam learned about a woman who was abusive to him. I mean, you see this stuff going on right now all around us. So it's a, uh, uh, it says a, a, a woman would tie up a cat in a house, take the cat, put a rope around its neck, tie it to a chair and abuse it. Prophet said a woman going, he heard about a woman going to hell, he said. See, it don't occur to us, we look around in society and you see something like what they call that, the ASPCA. You know, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty. To, man, that's Islamic. That's the Sunnah. That's in the spirit of the Sunnah where they go out to people and lock them up, man, and find them up do something to them for abusing animals, and that's the right punishment, because really, the real punishment will come from a law. So we, we are in a religion, a religious way of life that demands that we be compassionate to creation. First principle of the Sharia is the <laughs> preservation of human life. That's what makes it so criminal when Muslims take the life of innocent, non-combatant human beings, take their life for any reason. Not because they committed a capital crime, or not because they fight them, but just for some other reason. Right? That's a crime. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to move our hearts closer to one another. And we ask Allah to make us of those who act for freedom. Speak out for freedom, pray for freedom, and who pray and act and speak out against the zoom and the fitna of oppression. Subhanakallahumu wa bihamdi, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Bismillah <laughs> فإذا قرأت القرآن
فاستعذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم انه ليس له سلطان على الذين امنوا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون وصدق الله اللهم اغفر لنا مسلمين ومسلمات ومؤمنين ومؤمنات ومحسنين ومحسنات وبعد يا بليل دعوني ينهي بسين كل there are two types of oppression Allah says فَلَا تَزَالَمُوا don't oppress one another. Two types of oppression. Overt oppression and covert oppression. Oppression is open, widespread, easy to see, and oppression is subtle. That's on, as the young people say, that's on the down low. There is oppression of others, and then there is oppression of oneself. I'm sure that your brother doesn't have to warn you excuse me, about other people oppressing you and what you should do. What I do want to warn you about is us oppressing ourselves. <coughs> and settle with the ayah that I just read from the Quran, Allah says, when you read the Quran, seek Allah's protection from shaitan, the cursed and rejected one. No authority has he over those who believe and put their trust in their Lord. Matter of fact, I should have read this other part here where it says, it said, his authority is over those only who take him as a wakil, as a patron, as a friend, and who join uh, partners, whom be he Muslim, whom, and who join partners with Allah. That's what I'm going to you know, and I'm going to do it very quick. <coughs> We're taught in Islam. That the only power that shaitan has, the shaitan is our real enemy. Shaitan is the one identified in the Quran by Allah as our enemy. In the shaitan, the son that I do one will be. Surely the devil, surely Satan is to you a clear enemy, open enemy, un unrelenting enemy, Allah says. So treat him like that. But well, we are taught by Allah in the Quran that the only power that shaitan has over, over, uh, uh, over us as people is the power to whisper, the power to deceive, the power to lie. And he's been doing that ever since our earliest ancestors, Adam and Eve. Other than that, shaitan don't have no power, man. He do anything that you or me. No, rather he has the power to influence us to do it to ourselves. Even to the degree Allah says in the Quran that when each of us as people are questioned on the day of judgment why we did what we did, and we'll say the devil made me do it, and Allah says the devil will say, I didn't make you do anything. All I did was suggest it to you. You the one that used your own power of will and made a decision. Don't put that on me. In the day of judgment, we won't even be able to blame our enemy for what we have done to ourselves. So guard yourself. Guard your soul from the influence, the waswa of shaitan. Shaitan is called a waswa, whispering devil, because whisper, whispering is subtle. Devil don't shout, devil whisper. You're in a room, somebody's standing up talking loud or talking in the mic, you know. People fall asleep. Happens to some of y'all here. Much energy as I give off in the court bar and make it all kind of point of I still I look out and still see people falling asleep. 
You know what I mean? See, but if I was up standing up here whispering, if I was lowering my voice, you really wanted to understand what I was saying. He panicked, leaning forth. What did he say? Huh? Pay attention. The quieter I speak, the more I need to concentrate on what I'm saying, trying to understand. So that's how it is with Shaitan. Shaitan doesn't shout, Shaitan whispers. And everything that comes out of his mouth is no good for us. So be careful. I know you want to go fight the big shaitan. You better fight that little shaitan who's big in you. Talking to you, talking to myself. That's the shaitan. The prophet of the Islam said the greatest jihad is the jihad against the evil desires of one's own nafs. So what does your personal devil encourage you to do? And what are you doing about it? That's the question. What you doing about it? Do you try to change? And nobody knows your devil like you do. You know your devil. Because he's yours. You know what your devil whispers to you. The, the oppression that he encourages you to place on your own soul. So what do you do about it? Or do you speak about it? Or speak out of it and say, get, get behind me, Shaitan. Every time you say, I'll do the Latin and then Shaitan. You're speaking out against the evil as opposed to giving in to it. And we live in a society, I gotta wrap it up. We live in a society, man, they institutionalize everything wrong. Guarded by law. You know, the government don't want you selling drugs because the government sells the drugs. Right? The only way you sell drugs in America and get away with it, not get in trouble, is you go to the government and get a license. And they say, now, okay, here's your liquor license. Kamra, here's your license. Here's where you have prescription drug. Now we got medical marijuana. You know, just come to me, because I'm the big dog around here. Just come to me and I'll license you and you'll be all right. You try anything funny without coming to me, I'll send my troops to kick in your door and drag you out. That's, that's where we live. Every, everything Allah tells us don't do is make it, uh, everything Allah has made haram. We live in a society where they make it lawful. And you start messing around, you know what I mean, opposing what they have made lawful, they'll lock you up. Allah made karma haram. They said, no, it's all right for you to drink, man. Just when you get a certain age, just come here and it's okay. And if you start doing like they used to do in the early days in America, in the early days of America, you had people, in this case, they were Christian people, who were so upset about the selling of alcohol, they used to go get axes and kick in the door and bust up the bar and all of that kind of stuff. Let's, let us get together and just walk up and down St. Nicholas Avenue and go in every store where they're selling liquor and say, man, you're out of business, man. Grab that stuff in it. Man, they'll pick up the phone and dial 911. Next door, next day, the Muslims will be on the, uh, you know, on the newspaper and in the TV. Muslims attack innocent sellers of Khamra. <laughs> and when you go stand before the judge and say, well, Allah forbade this and this, that again. And you say, oh man, that's your religion. I'm sorry, but you broke this law. That's the end of that. Law forbade homosexuality. Okay, pass a law. You got a law for it now. Go right downtown. Get a license. Get a license to disobey a law. That's, that's where we live. Now. That's where we live. I said the other day, I'm going someplace else and I ain't got all that. I said, good luck. And ain't there, it's on the way. <laughs> so may Allah to Baraka with the you know. Protect us. Allah protect us from ourselves.
from the subtle influence of the shaitan. I, I know Muslims, they say, man, I'm not going for that stuff. Oh, yeah, and also, don't let me forget, the worst reba, you know, usury, perfectly legal here. Perfectly legal. You know? So about everything you do got some interest tacked onto it. Y'all believe it? Go home and look at your carnet bill. Turn the carnet bill over and look on the back. Turn the telephone bill and look on the back. You know, a little fine print. Got interest on there, man. Right? You, you really in the middle of here. So we have to ask a lot of protectors. And I know Muslims who say, I'm not down with no riba. I don't drink. I don't whatever. But then, you know, looking at them, they don't pray. They got tattoos. They got false hair, and all this kind of stuff that Allah has forbidden, and the Prophet made clear, don't do that, and you got Muslims doing it anyway, as Muslims. I guess I'll talk about that last week, next week, how we follow the culture of Kufar on, uh, on one hand while denouncing the Kufar on the other, while engaging in their culture and their practices. Some of y'all, you come to Juma that way. I'm going to tell you brothers again, and I'm going to close out, okay? When you come to Juma, put on your best clothes. Stop coming to Juma looking like you're going to the park, ball, the, uh, the park to play ball. Whatever style of clothes you got on, if you're wearing the colonial clothes, put, <laughs> you might have if you're wearing the colonial clothes, put on the best of the colonial clothes. Get a suit, get a tie, get, you know, come looking like you coming to the worship of Allah. If you're wearing your cultural clothing, put on the best of the cultural clothing. This is our way of life, and every little thing you do like that is freedom for your soul. Freeing your mind from influence of devils. Just like every prayer you make is freeing the soul from the oppression of the what caused by the whisper of shaitan. All of this is about freedom and oppression. And Allah wants us to be free. I want you to be free, so make this Allah. I want you to be free, so reach in your pocket and free yourself up by giving zakah and sadaqa. Don't keep yourself enslaved to the threat, Allah says. Let not shaitan threaten you, intimidate you with poverty. I want you to be free from that. So how do you get free? You give. How do you get free from becoming captive to the world? Five times a day you stop, you turn to Allah, and you pray to Salah. How do you get free from being enslaved to food? At least 29 or 30 days out of the year, once a year, no other time, you put aside the food and you drink, and you say, man, somebody said, man, why are you doing this? And say, I'm doing it for Allah, because I want to be free. How do you get free from the cycle of always going to the house of Fir'aun, or the house of Hilton, or the house of uh, who, whoever, whoever, and you buy one, at least once in your life, you free yourself by going to the house of Allah. Even though when you get to Mecca, they got a Hilton right across the street from the Kaaba. You can sleep in there, but still, you sleep in there because you're going to visit Allah's house. This is freedom. Freedom Allah wants for you and I. Not captivity. When you put on your best clothes, take a bath, put on a little oil, brothers, put on your best clothing, you're freeing yourself from the image of yourself imposed upon you and I by unbelievers, you know, and in this case it's really, you know, Judeo-Christian unbelieving culture who went into the country of your origin and imposed their culture on your culture. That's why people in India, people in Africa dress like they're in Europe somewhere. You didn't always dress that way. Why do you dress that way? 
because somebody else came in and enslaved you in your culture and imposed their values on you and I. At least African Americans, man, they, they, everything they did to us was just by force. Somebody said, why are you dressed like that? You know, and I have kids that come here to visit. Mr. Imam, why are you dressed like that? I tell them because I'm trying to be free. It's my choice. Because ain't nobody going to make me dress any differently. That's the, you know, that's, my, that's the, the attitude of some of us. And you might say, well, I'm on the plantation. I, I got to dress in a way so their master won't bother me. Okay, good. Then when you go home, when you go to the mosque, when you go to in your house, take off the clothing and the habits that Massa has imposed on you and be your free self. And say, well, I'm just trying to keep my job, man. I'm free. So may Allah Taala bless us with some freedom. Freedom comes in degree. Resist oppression. Resist the whisper of shaitan and the shayateen. And resist the oppression that the devil tries to impose upon us by getting us to do harm to ourselves. Let us be free and worship Allah. Subhanaka wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Ameen wa alfa ikama.